<laughs> it is June the 3rd, 2023, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. Good morning. No, good after where, wherever you whenever you are and wherever morning, you are. Hey, this is this is Chris. Hello. We have another episode and uh, of course, you've heard him Jeremiah and Adrian. Hello, hello, hello. Hey. How's everyone doing? Oh. Uh, <laughs> back on location, you know, away in my echoey, you know, rental chamber here. It's and, not a, uh, it's not that no, it's it it last year it was bigger, more yes, echoey. Was, this yeah, year this the different something works. Works See, better. Season 2 digs have definitely got a better audio quality than season 1 digs, <laughs> yeah. I tell you that. Closer and it has nothing. It, it has nothing to do with our humongous budget. No. So um, let's see. We. <laughs> this is this is so funny how these episodes come together. Sometimes you know, uh, we we ask in our chat room who who has a topic, who who wants to, what do you guys want to talk about, and for some reason this time we all threw something in there. So it's another. What is it? Another magazine of an episode with different topics and they all kind of go along the same topic which is who wants to say it <laughs> no no no, it's hey, not, hey, no. mine hey. isn't mine isn't mine is about the future of photography well, they, are, they are they kind of are they kind they of are. are so i have a question for everybody just to kick yeah. this off because i think this is a, a sort of a ubiquitous uh, umbrella to the future of photography and photographs themselves so my question is, with the overwhelming amount of AI-generated imagery, which really are so close to actual photographic renderings, that one looks very carefully at every image, or less careful at each image, and the impact of a real amazing, dazzling in real life photograph is now diminished by the surreality or over perfectionism of AI quality semi uh, imagery, which is very interesting to me because I'm just, I'm relating this to how I'm looking at stuff, certainly posted online, I'm not talking about prints. I'm talking about my reaction to posted imagery. So if I'm going through a batch of, posted photographs and I see a landscape <clears throat> that is interesting, you know, I'll give it a few seconds of, of, uh, of my attention, but the next one may be an absolutely dazzlingly edited version, maybe in real life, but edited significantly by Photoshop or whatever. And then the third image may be a completely constructed image. Um, and I, I just feel that my attention to real photographs has diminished um, or there's a competition in a way for my eyeballs of a, what provokes a stronger reaction. I, I can't really describe it, but it, there's an influence. That's really, that's really okay, interesting. So before, before we dive into this, I just want to mention one thing because I can I can already hear some listeners rolling their eyes. Oh man! Oh, oh God! They are talking are, about AI yeah. again. Here we go again. Um, and do you remember when photography went digital and everyone called it digital photography sure. for years, yeah. uh -huh. even though it is just photography, just with different tools? And uh, you wouldn't say I'm using an AI to set a tea timer. No, you're talking to a to a, an assistant. Uh, asking him to set a timer. So the, the AI is everywhere. It will be everywhere, even more than these days. So um, we are talking about photography and imagery with the assistance of AI systems. Yeah. Well, I think and what Jeremiah is talking about there is the societal impact of it all, actually. Oh, yes. Oh, and yes. the artistic impact of it all, because for a hundred plus years the easiest way to make an image has been to take a photograph right so that's easier for most people than painting it's easier for most people than drawing it's easier for most people than tapestry you know it's so uh, we suddenly find ourselves and and digital photography was easier than film photography 
and phone photography was easier than dedicated camera digital photography so it, but, but we find for me that one of the things that's different about what Jeremiah just said is that for the first time in a long time it's easier to make compelling images a, a different way than making photographs and then editing them in photoshop or, or or an app on your phone or whatever it is so it's not surprising to me that suddenly there are a great many of these because it's a lot easier to write a single prompt for mid-journey than it is to do a tapestry right yeah and it is and by their very nature they're going to be um more uh, they're going to jump out at you more as images because they are less natural. So our eyes are attuned to seeing landscapes because that's how we've evolved. But we're not being attuned to see, I don't know, b b whatever it is. I, I can't even think of a description because the, the imagery we're seeing these days at the moment is so wild and wacky and, and in some ways amazing. Right? So I'm not surprised, Jeremiah, that you're not, your brain is glossing over actual real photo photographs at the moment. Yeah, or, or there's something happening to uh, my aesthetic reaction overall. Sorry about this truck backing up somewhere. Um, <laughs> it's real life here. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to filter it out after the fact. Uh, anyway, it, something is happening to my aesthetic, and I'm, I feel sensitive to how I react to art and imagery, etc. Uh, but it, there's a change going on in my brain of how I look at photographs. And it's because of AI that that distinction, I'm not saying it's better, worse, less impactful or more. I'm just saying it's different. There's this comparison. And, and, may, and maybe there will be, uh, the, we will sort of get used to it and, and rearrange our brains to kind of get this into into another new normal maybe so well we, got, uh, we did get there when we would now all look at thumbnails or, or tiny photos on our phones or, don't we? or just a notion of photoshop and and fixing faces and that kind of stuff or, or will, will we just think of photographs as being it's the difference between say fiction and non-fiction literature in other words will we just look at photographs um, as fiction always um now Possible. until proven otherwise uh, that's that's a very very interesting reaction but something uh something is definitely uh in the wind here and and uh of course the weaponization of that both in um audio video and um and photographic imagery is going to start emerging certainly in the new uh, US election and one could just feel what's coming and um, it, 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 it's almost impossible to prepare for it because people are not, most people are not armed with the understanding of, of false imagery. You know, they're not really paying attention as we are to what's happening. Um, so I'm, I'm really, you know, it, there's a worry there about the weaponization of false imagery uh, and those who, you know, who know me and follow me um, know that I also celebrate <laughs> the creation <laughs> of false imagery and have for a long time, even, you know, predating my specific on, um, on AI. All right. So with that philosophical entry into this episode, um, we have brought three topics and then we have three picks. So it's basically six picks of the week today um so let's kick this off with the first one adrian you brought this one um are we closer to mind reading apparently we are um uh according to this website so this is a thing called mind video uh and uh it's an interesting um it's an interesting experiment it is very much an experiment at this point but the idea here is that uh you read brain waves i guess using an mri image and you interpret those brain waves uh with um uh, very 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 clever software let's say and with the idea that the the software uh re um uh, recreates uh, what it is that you're you're 
brain is seeing now how is it that you do that because how is it that you know what somebody's seeing well actually i think you show them a video so so if you are having a, your brain scanned at the point in time when you're watching a video and that that imagery on the video uh, is is what is um stimulating your brain at the time uh, then you pass that and then if you can read the mri information and put it into a software algorithm that then tries to recreate the imagery uh, what you have is this mind video experiment and it's quite amazing actually there are uh, numerous examples clearly only the best ones yeah the best outcomes it is an so, experiment so here here Lots at the top failures. we see this slideshow kind of thing with like on the left side the real video and on the right side the reconstruction and it, it's of course not exactly the same but it gets the gist of what is in the frame yeah. like people walking horses fish um, absolutely i'm wondering I'm wondering if this could be uh, applied um, with a little bit of, of kind of a support to a um, to medical uses for people who are, you know, semi comatose, can't speak. Uh, even I think that's the goal, in, right? To, well, to that's, communicate that's, visually, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Possibly. So, I mean, as as long as you're as long as you've got an MRI scanner in your pocket, um, and presumably you're not wearing soon, metal. Soon hey, coming. I'm, <laughs> soon coming yeah um then uh you don't need a camera anymore uh because this is the future of photography guys right and in the future You've... of photography your brain will be scanned automatically uh for the images that you see and will record without the need for an actual camera all you have to do is sleep in an mri and then you have your your dream diary <laughs> as video yes so well you know as we record you, you this... know how frustrating that is when you wake up and you forget what you dreamt <laughs> well no need for that anymore yeah, if you will. there's playback <laughs> this guy I, i'm not sure uh, that i put yeah the, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of strong magnetic currents around an mri isn't it i'm not quite sure what it would do if you had long-term exposure to that i i don't know if any studies have been done um but uh it they have and they're, they end in tears <laughs> yeah it doesn't doesn't sound like it's a good thing to spend your yeah. life in that strength of magnetic field so um, i suspect uh it'll be one that stays on the research bench for a while but um i thought it was really interesting because we talk sometimes about the future of cameras right and this is a future of photography with no cameras um so interesting stuff maybe interesting stuff <laughs> so next up google Google, ah, Google, Google. Google. They, Google. They've been up to stuff. Heard of them? I've heard yeah, of them. yeah, yeah, yeah. They won't won't last. Um, actually, maybe they won't last. To be honest. <laughs> okay, this is this is about this is about uh, product photography. What is Google doing? Yeah, so this is this is another one that uh, I found, which I thought was interesting. Um, uh, especially since I personally have been doing lots of product photography this year for for my wife's online shop. Um, but this is uh, a software service uh, from Google. Uh, that allows you to use generative AI to create different types of product shot. So let's say you've got a product and you've taken your, uh, I don't say so your bog standard white background, or you've just placed it on a, a roughly white or gray background um, and, and taken a photo of the product. Then what you can do uh, is you can uh, use generative AI to place your product in a more sort of uh, a set type shot, a sort of tabletop set type shot, or in a, uh, a sort of li a lifestyle kind of environment. Um, and you can use um, uh, inspiration images to uh, think what happens is you, you you put an image in that you like the look of and then you ask it to describe that in text and then then you then you paste that text into the prompt to generate with your product shot um, you know, a, a new shot for your product. Uh, does it does it need, need a product shot or can you just describe your product and it'll create the imagery? <laughs> well, I think if you're trying to send reviews, so poss and possibly, reviews. possibly, but I think given that this is being positioned at people who sell products, I suspect it's more important to get the product bit right. And then the, the background to the, or the, the, the set that the product sits in is, is the thing that you could flex. So this is kind of, this is uh, something that perhaps you'd also be able to do in photoshop at the at this point i don't know um yeah. uh, uh, the latest photoshop beta does yeah. exactly that right? sure it does so but they're not yeah. the, but adobe are not the only ones obviously yeah. 
Adrian, I, I have a, a, a really interesting uh, pitch for you. You just, while I was watching this, I realized, oh, here's an idea. Here's an idea for, for a service. Uh, people send in pictures of their family or even better, pictures of uh, a couple separate, you know, just close-ups of, you know, uh, those who are going to be married. Uh, you send it in, and the AI creates a complete <laughs> wedding album <laughs> placed, you know, on the islands, having fun, you know, skiing, yeah, yeah. whatever, oh. just just enjoying. And, and that becomes a wedding album, which you then give to the couple on, for a wedding present. Oh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. You, or you could have famous photographs. What's that? What's, who is it who shot that famous photograph of the sailor kissing the girl in Times Square? Sure. Yeah, yeah, you could you could have that. You could say, okay, here are my subjects. Here's half a dozen photos of the groom, half a dozen photos of the bride, and you could recreate some of those. You could be John Travolta and Olivia Newton John. You See, why be. do we feel that that's already happening as we're saying this? <laughs> oh, movie posters, everything uh, lends itself. Like some of them are so iconic, you want to be in them, of course. Yeah. Anyway, and it's and it's and it's clearly possible now. Oh yeah, clearly. Uh, probably clearly. we can do it ourselves if we really took the time yeah. to do that. But and there are online services. I mean, the the thing Google does with the product photos yeah. is is not is not unique at this no. point. There are other services where you can get exactly the same thing. Um, it's just not yeah. nicely integrated. No, Have and you if you tried... can do it on your phone, if it's a Google thing, and you can do it on your phone, that might be interesting as well. I mean, well, speaking. We, we... Sorry, go ahead, Jeremiah. Oh, just speaking of, of uh, beta Photoshop, um, has anybody been playing with generative? This is a rhetorical question, of course. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, experimenting with it, both positively and, and negatively. I, you know, I've, yeah. I've found I haven't really in any way mastered it, uh, but, but uh, it is an astonishing a uh, bit of technology um, at its kind of base level right now, but you just know it's it's going places. And uh, I was very, very impressed. And yet I had some significant fails. So, uh, no. <laughs> so interesting. I, th I think this is an interesting point in time where with, with Photoshop having come out with, uh, with a beta and you can just replace a background and drag, yeah. a, mm -hmm. drag a rectangle and put anything in that with a prompt. This seems to be one of these moments where a lot of people finally get to play with this technology that haven't so far because it was too complicated mm -hmm. so think, i'm yeah. i'm seeing a lot of reactions from people who brushed this, that holy eye thing away for the last half year and now i get a lot of feedback from people saying well have you seen photoshop have you seen <laughs> oh my god and uh, I, I received the exact same reaction from people about our next topic, which is the Paragraphica camera. So there's this guy, he's, in, he's from Denmark, and he's built this weird contraption that has this red funny thing uh, instead of a lens. And then on the back, it has, um, it has uh, some displays and a few dials and... And then you press the button and it takes a photo, but it's not a photo. It's a generated image based on several parameters, like the location where the picture is being taken, the weather, the time of day, and other things go into that. And then something gets generated that is, well... The, the, the demo video snippet shows you something that looks very similar to what was in front of the camera. I have my doubts that this is exactly what it works like. And um, <clears throat> just on a meta level, I've received a dozen forwards from people or mentions on social media. I said, you have to look at this. This is, wow, look at this. This is amazing. And... Um, I looked at it and, and it, honestly, that thing isn't making any, isn't doing anything really special. So, what we're looking at is a, is a, I think it's an art project. Uh, it's a, it's a prototype, a one of a kind from a 3D printer. The thing on its front is, uh, I think it's, 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 it's reminiscent of some feeler of a, of a, of a specific mole that has this star-shaped thing on its, on its mouth. And 
and and what that that thing is pretty much calling a few APIs in the background, uh, querying the weather, querying the location, and I wouldn't be surprised if it looks up like pictures on Google it from does. that location. No, it, it actually. Then, uh, Chris, it does. And then uh, exactly, yeah, that, that that was my thought. And then analyzes those um, through the clip uh, protocol, which or clip network, and then creates a prompt that it then throws into stable diffusion, and the yeah. picture comes out. And, so and it's a chain. It's a chain of of different things. Yeah, ironically, this this was my pick of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so he stole that. Uh, so it's only five clearly, things right? on this episode. <laughs> um, I, uh, yes, I mean there, there's. The, I, I I attempted to use the virtual um, camera uh, online, but it was so busy. I guess it just could not. Uh, well, connect with the location services. Um, but if you enter a prompt with location services. Um, and add all of the prompts that this person has integrated into this camera virtual or otherwise, uh, you should theoretically end up with a very similar kind of image. It, you can address the weather and the distance and the lens and the quality, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, uh, maybe a year ago when we were talking about what would be the, the amazing kind of cameras of the future, I do remember saying it would be great to have a camera where I could take a picture and actually prompt it. I don't think I used the word prompt, but address certain changes. And uh, I think that would be, you know, close conceptually to this. And I can see the future of camera design integrating a lot of these um, right now. They're very crude. But and with spoken voice. In other words, I take the picture and I just push a button on my camera and I go winter side light, you know, uh, dawn, uh, you know, no traffic, extra traffic, and and the photograph would interpolate. You know, for for me, what is most interesting, it, the the project itself is fun and everything, but the the meta level on why did this thing go so viral? Why does it, what does it do with people's imagination that makes them go, wow? I mean, this this yeah. is the real question for me. How does this work? Because I've received this from people who are not into photography, but who know that I'm into photography. And of course I have to know about this wonderful new camera kind of thing. How does, the, what is it that, that is, this camera triggers in people? I, I think it's the new Kodak moment. Right. Or, you know, the 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 or the place where you had to start, you know, and look at your point, you stand here, put your camera through the frame and get the get the image, because I think you could be let's say you you had an opportunity to go somewhere. So, yeah, let's say you had an opportunity to go to Paris, but you could only go in November and not in the spring. Right. Or or you wanted to go to Japan and see the cherry blossoms but you had you weren't able to be there at the right time of year or the fall colors in the pacific northwest or wherever yeah imagine it yeah that sort of thing and you get so you yeah you can imagine going okay so i want this photograph i really want this photograph but actually i'd really love it with if the trees had blossoms on them and or if the if the tree of the colors of the yeah the, of the leaves were oranges and reds and and browns or something like that or just sunny right and and so the parisians that were walking by in my photos weren't huddled under umbrellas and you know and in raincoats they were wearing nice summer dresses and and hats yeah that, i can sure. imagine the, this is, it, yeah there's a direct correlation to maybe um the psychology of and, and i'm talking kind of writ large here in just in terms of how we culturally um may feel that we are less and less in control of our life, our world, the changes, etc., and by being able to control what we see or put out there, is a way of reestablishing our sense of like control over our universe. I think uh, I've is, heard you say that before, or maybe maybe Chris actually related to selfies and the yeah. the projection people make of themselves online through you know, yeah. advanced filters for selfies. Yeah, I think it's a psychological, cultural, historical moment that creates that need or that attraction, which would explain why so many people reacted and sent you that 
Um, it, it's just this this need as cultural and, and political social institutions become less trusted over the years globally. I'm not talking about any specific countries, but this is happening, that people really feel they need to some kind of self um, empowerment, and this is the ultimate um, hmm. empowerment. Because you can put yourself <clears throat> in that in that picture. I'm sure there are ways of just going. Well, I want me in this picture, even though I'm taking it. I don't know. Oh, very well, interesting we'll, point in time. We'll we'll get to an in an inverse of that in uh, okay. in my pick of the week. Um, which yeah, let's let's move over to the picks. Um, Adrian, you brought us hardware. Oh yeah. Um, uh, so uh, just something that I got a couple of this week actually. Um, so I decided that uh, my Thunderbolt two big box uh, raid arrays uh, uh, are no longer the uh, the backup unit of choice in, in my household. So I bought, the, and this is this. I know I'm a bit slow here, but this is the first time I've ever bought external SSDs uh, for for backing up and for using. So I bought a couple of Crucial X8 SSDs this week, and uh, on first play, it's not really play, I suppose, it first use, um, I've just found them to be really easy. And you know, uh, I'm sure there are many other manufacturers that sell great products as well, but these are my pick of the week because these are the ones that I went for. So these are backup very SSD inexpensive. Drives. They are. Yeah, they tell you what. That's one of the reasons I got them. So I, I, they, they were curiously inexpensive when I found them online. Uh, so I went, made sure to go and see some reviews, uh, you know, sort of technical benchmarking type reviews, as well as you know, uh, yeah, you know, how long will they last? Kind of reviews, uh, and they, they rated very well. So they, they are a good chunk cheaper, for example, than Samsung and sandisk drives but similarly which I, I have the sandisk and four terabytes is, is not not cheap no and i bought a couple of two terabytes so uh yeah. but a two terabyte drive and just just state of the world right a two terabyte solid state drive was a hundred pounds that is interesting that the prices have come yeah. down this far. The SanDisk yeah. ones are about 170, I think. So it depends yeah. on which brand you go with. And of course, SanDisk are very, very highly regarded in this space, aren't they? Are portable, you know, nearly indestructible drives. But yeah. All right. Two, two terabytes. Run. Imagine that. Imagine saying that in the 1950s, right? <laughs> Or even the 1990s. People wouldn't know what a terabyte is. So, yeah. so in um, uh, last Sunday, Monica and I went to a museum about an hour from here, which was f a, a, an underground in an underground bunker of sorts. Even though it was very nice, but um, built by the Nazis in 1938, it was an amplification station for all the all the telephone and, te and and telex wires going through Germany. So they needed amplification and that was a secret location back then. And they built an old farmhouse on top. And now it's a museum of old um, telephone and telecommunications technology. Yeah. And it's, fun. it's it's one of these places you, you see this farmhouse and it's very inconspicuous and you open the door and a big, big staircase goes down and there's two yeah. underground floors and very industrial, very, um, as you would expect. And they, ha they had all this old, old, uh, old telex machines, everything in working condition, by the way. So um, you That's could send a telex from one room to the other and that kind of stuff. I love that, um, yeah. and, 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 and seeing the development since then uh, is just, yeah. It's wild. And it's crazy. I've worked it's in the, the British equivalent of that, actually, which was the place where it was the centre of government communications. It was their fallback position out in the countryside mm -hmm. uh, if they could no longer stay in London. Uh, and uh, I, I've worked in the, the, at this particular place on and off several times over my career. Um, and it's, a, it's one of these places where the underground site is twice the size of the above ground site. And until very recently, till, five, till 10 years ago, it was still full of World War II telephone switches and things like that um, and mm -hmm. they had a big project and never got to go down there because it was a restricted area but um i saw the photos of what they were bringing back up and stuff uh, fantastic uh, in london I've, I've shot you know the, the there is that underground um 
under where would it be under the step down from oh god I'm blanking on it but you know it's in central london and there's the war there are the war rooms yeah, which is a museum these days yeah the war church yeah, yeah. war rooms i've i've done that, uh, an event down there that's as well. it yeah. Yeah, fascinating. All the equipment is there. It's really, I've shot down there. So I, I, I found it absolutely dazzlingly. <laughs> yeah, it's a also, museum and also mostly used for and, corporate parties these days. And, and in, yeah, it wasn't a museum. Enough, it was closed off. When I was yeah, interestingly enough, you don't even have to go that far back. If you, if you took someone from, I don't know, 25 years ago and plant them uh, in today's time, they, they wouldn't recognize a thing. Oh, yeah. like, no. like the the communication the telecommunication our devices uh, the, the. anyway next pick would be well um this Let's is yours it. jeremiah we already <laughs> had the paragraphica in the yeah, show sorry. so it, this is your this is your chance to swap it out briefly if you have something yeah. otherwise i'll i'll elbow mine in no i, I want to stick to this because i i, I did I, I was taken by it i i found the the t name of it very curious the paragraphica. paragraphica um maybe it means some other people but um i, I just felt that there it, you know this felt like an emotional <laughs> technical response to how we feel about our lives <laughs> that, that, yeah. that's really it it's it's an emotional response maybe that's what it is it's an emotional response yeah all right so i i want to bring this around back into proper photography street photography oh. but with an ai twist because um here's an yeah, article about course, right? a street photographer who uses ai face swapping to hide his subject's identity ah. so um just just imagine um the photographer taking just a regular street photo as you would and then running that through some AI to swap out the faces. The, the faces are different, so it's a different person on the photo. Um, but it fits the photo. It doesn't look artificial or strange. Um, it's just a different person there. And if you are, let's say, in a country where the whole privacy thing is um, is important, in Germany, for example, that will be the case, um, then you would possibly benefit from something like this i can see yeah. how yeah i can so you get the it, it, it's interesting because the first first thought you think well why would that be useful? surely street photography is about the people in the street but as you say when there's uh, there are privacy concerns at a national level like you have in germany um then you know you can see why that might appeal to some people I think licensing would be something like if you wanted to use a street photograph in a commercial, in a ad, um, without permission, you couldn't do it with a normal kind of snap on the street, uh, without a That's true. You know, signature, yeah. now, but, but, and here's the rub, will they be able to kind of get the right and I'm, you know, I think we, we feel this now by swapping out the street and AI. It could be a whole other lawsuit about which is to, looking looking at the at the legalities, which are very different in in different countries. Um, uh, here in Germany, you would probably not be allowed to do this, or you'd have you, you'd ha there would be a case against you as a photographer doing this because um, you can't even take that photo in the first place without asking. Ah, so okay. it's, it, it starts earlier, and then in the end, it also comes down to would that person recognize themselves in the yes, photo? Yes, yes. So the, the, the clothes, the, everything is there. It's just the faces swapped out. So I found this interesting, though. I've just probably... When, when, when did the, the first GANs come out that made convincing people's faces three years ago maybe if, if that something along those lines so yeah. back then someone built an open source tool to which which i haven't been able to find anymore unfortunately who who did this in a fully automated way so you you throw in a picture well let's say a group shot with 50 people and it would identify each and every face and generate a new face and replace it and swap it out so you could have an entire group of people be well sort of anonymized the, the, i think the legalities are are certainly 
questionable now that nothing is is settled law in any country as far as no. I can see um, for example on, on on the show that I'm doing I you know I have a wall a, a video wall with you know 30 or 40 people on on a big kind of zoom call um, and I used metahumans you know for that but I couldn't get close to them enough to recognize any of them even though they're extremely human um, because there's there's uh, questions of legality and unions and extras and all of that stuff that haven't been settled. So they're afraid, well, where did these qualities of the face come from? Is this purely constructed by a machine? Were they drawn? Uh, where is the license? And no lawyer in any kind of big media company wants to entertain uh, a lawsuit, so they'll just nix it. And this is where I think Adobe has the biggest advantage, even though their their Firefly uh, image generator isn't as good as no. others in direct comparison. It is good enough, and they um, they advertise that with um, with a claim that all these things have been the, the training data for that has been legally sourced from Google uh, from uh, from Adobe. Adobe store. stock, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's it's it's business safe, so to speak. Yeah, and when they when they start to integrate, uh, you know, their their version of Runway ML, which I'm sure they're working on, um, it will be then uh, can widely used. I think certainly in the advertising business initially. Um, but you know we're about to see the explosion. I mean, I've I've been on a wait list for Gen Two ML for I don't know. Me since too. They announced it. I think it's coming soon. I can't wait. <laughs> That's the technology that for a filmmaker, image maker, like myself, I just can't. You know, I'm I'm very excited about the possibilities of of being able to make a, an epic motion picture uh, at home in my underwear. All right. I was with you right up to that last bit. <laughs> with, with that picture, with that yeah. picture. Um, I have everyone. very, very nice. Uh, yes, your, your prompt has generated a picture in my brain, Jeremiah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, so so that's generative AI in your brain Brilliant. by there just, you, no, you don't even, see, as a human, you don't even need a lengthy prompt. All you need is a short mention and it'll turn into a meme and it'll embed itself in your brain there's and you no conquering soap, imagination yeah. yeah so yeah it doesn't need complicated painting pictures All right. with words there we go with very little words okay. we are completion machines our brains are pattern com completion machines anyway po poets that was it the new visual <laughs> poets, artist <yes. laughs> we'll be back in a week from now with more exciting content around well some proper photography, I guess. Until then, take care. And bye. See you, folks. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com.